Lord. That's incredible. Uh, so they came out the water running and baptizing, and that's just how it's supposed to be, amen. And speaking of baptisms, of course, uh, today is very exciting. We had uh, two young ladies come to be baptized in the first service, amen. And so uh, Lisa, who's the team, is the sister of Christ, Angie, who's in the campus ministry, were baptized this afternoon. And then uh, excitingly as well, there'll be another uh, guy coming to be baptized later today, amen? Uh, we're going to turn over to uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, we'll introduce the lesson from this verse in Proverbs chapter 16. As you're turning there, we're going to say a prayer. Father uh, God, we're so grateful, Lord, to come to you right now. Uh, God, we're thankful that we can access you at any moment. Right now, Father, we want to um, present to you, God, ourselves as living sacrifices for you. Uh, Father God, we know, Lord, that as we sing to you, as we have fun, as we have family together today, that God, uh, ultimately, Father, we want to be conformed into your image, God. We want to become more like you. And Father, I just pray that you'll speak through this sermon as we continue our series in the book of Daniel. We love you, Father. Fill us with your spirit. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 If you're visiting with us, we've been going through a series in the book of Daniel called Daring Faith During Dark Times. Ooh, Amen. Oh and certainly the world's experienced dark times, but our goal as we study the book of Daniel is to be able to get a faith that can withstand anything that comes our way, even death itself. And the church says, Amen. you know, the one thing that causes people to fall away, you guys have seen it. You've seen disciples that get fired up, they get baptized, they said Jesus is Lord. And then over time, maybe quickly, or maybe over years, they turn back on their original commitment they made to God. And you go, how can that happen after God loved us so much and literally gave his life and shed his blood for us? Well, it's simply because I believe a sin comes into our lives. In fact, this is the first sin ever committed. So I thought the first sin that being committed was eating a, you know, an apple on a tree. Well, the Bible doesn't say it was an apple, and it wasn't fruit being eaten on a tree. That was the first sin. You know what the first sin ever committed was? Pride. Remember Satan's rebellion? Satan got prideful, got jealous of God. We'll talk about that in a moment. But, of course, if you think about it, pride is why we are in the spiritual war. It's why there's an enemy to Christianity. Pride is so scary. Because it's literally where Lucifer became Satan. Obviously, why did God create Satan? God didn't create Satan. Lucifer chose to become Satan. Are you with me right here? He chose to be prideful and be arrogant. And we'll look at that here in a moment. In Proverbs 16, the Bible says in verse 18, Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. So you guys know the saying, pride comes before the fall. Amen? And of course, what came in before Satan's fall? Pride did. Go to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14 uh, traditionally has been seen as accounting the fall of Satan. Now, in its literal context, it actually applies to us because it's describing Babylon's fall. Now, we've been studying Daniel. Remember, Daniel's living in a time where he was taken as a captive, as a slave, if you will, under King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. This was represented in that statue we studied as the head of gold, and it was known as the Golden Empire because it was Powerful. It was an impressive empire to be a part of. In fact, Babylonia was surrounded by these walls that they were 30 feet high. And you could have three chariots racing each other on top of the walls of Babylon. Is that pretty intense? So this was a powerful kingdom. Well, Isaiah describes here the king of Babylon falling, but you'll see there's a parallel really to the arch enemy of Christianity, Satan. Look at Isaiah 14 and verse 12. It says, how you have fallen from heaven. O morning star, son of the dawn. That's where the word Lucifer comes from in the King James. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned in the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend to the above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. I will, I will, I will, and not God's will. You see that right there? And we're going to find pride always starts with an I will, a selfish intent versus humility that's focused totally on God. And so Satan saw God's throne and goes, I will ascend to that. I want all the glory. I want to be the one in charge. 
It was autonomy to its fullest extent, wanting to start his own kingdom. And of course, the king of Babylon, we see some parallels with as we study the book of Daniel. Are you with me right here? What was the result of this bride? Well, the Bible says in verse 15, But you were brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you, they ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made the kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a desert and overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home? That's what it would be the fate, as you're going to see today. We're going to study out two kings that succumbed to pride, and it led to their destruction. And we as Christians, we need to know this is written in the Bible for us to take heed and to learn from, amen? So that we do not fall. But the scripture goes, people would look at the king and go, is that the guy that used to like lead that powerful empire? And he's totally fallen now? Totally weakened? Hopefully, no one will see you 10 years from now and go, is that the brother that used to like do Bible studies with people? And used to preach the word? You guys ever run into a fall away on the street? Yeah. They look totally different, don't they? Life's beating them up. Dress totally different. And you go, was that the sister that used to like lead in the ministry? Was that the brother that used to be an intern for the church? Wow. What happened? Pride. Something happened where they got self-focused and it became their will instead of God's will. And it led them off the path of truth. And we need to understand that pride, God opposes. Look in 1 Peter chapter 5. In 1 Peter chapter 5. The right hand man of Jesus, who, of course, he gave the keys to the kingdom, writes this in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Well, now we understand. The Bible says God opposes the proud. So pride is the one sin that God, like, fights against. You start being prideful, God decides, that guy's my enemy. I'm fighting against him. Why does he fight against it so much? Well, we just learned... Pride probably reminds God of the first sin ever committed. Yeah. So you need to understand, pride puts you on the other side. Yeah. That means that when you are prideful, you're acting like Satan. He goes, that reminds me of the enemy of Christianity who said, I will ascend. I'll be the man, right? So we need to talk about what is pride? Well, pride can be getting satisfaction from, you know, uh, accomplishments in your mind or achievements that... You have done, and so you take the glory for that. We'll talk about that more here in a moment. Pride is most accurately, in my opinion, defined from a biblical perspective as not being in touch with where you're really at spiritually. That, that's pride. A good example is in Luke 7. You remember the sinful woman comes in, and she's just broken about her sin. and comes to Jesus and is washing his feet with her hair. And, and Jesus goes, man, your faith is incredible. Your sins have been forgiven. And she gave up that year's worth of wages to, you know, pour out that perfume on his feet. You guys remember that story? Yeah. And then you remember in contrast, it's the prideful Pharisee. And he's like, doesn't Jesus know this woman's a sinner? And what are you doing? He's super judgmental. And the idea is that this woman was totally in touch with where she was at spiritually. She understood, without God, I'm nothing. I'm broken. I just need to get to Jesus. Where the Pharisee was totally thought, I'm the man, I'm the spiritual one, and he was the one that God was opposing. Right. And one person left that conversation or that dinner saved that night, and that was the woman. Are you with me right here, guys? So we got to understand how dangerous pride is. We can be out of touch. You guys ever been in school? I don't know if you're in high school and you had like that, the class clown. And, and there's always kind of like that one guy or that one girl that like, you know, just kind of speaks up and always makes all the jokes. You ever had a class clown that's just like not really funny? And everyone knows this guy's not funny, and they're just kind of totally out of touch with their, their, their themselves. And they think they're hilarious, and you're just going, this person is just out of their mind. They are out of touch. That, that's like pride. Sometimes we think humility is like going, well, I'm a loser, and I'm a nobody, and I'm just dirt, and so I'm going to carry myself with this meek demeanor. And, it's, and we think of humility as someone who's not confident. That's not humility either, guys. Humility is very confident because you know how God sees you. 
you know that God forgave you, that God loves you, and he sees you as royalty in his eyes. Are you with me right here? So you got to avoid all extremes and understand being humble is just having an accurate view of who I am. Now, as we've studied out Nebuchadnezzar, the king, you've seen there's been moments of clarity and humility, and he understood who he was, the ruler of Babylon, but he had a spiritual outlook at different times, did he not? And then at other times, he had an unspiritual outlook, and we're going to look at that today. Let's go to Daniel chapter 4, and we'll get into our two kings that wrestle with pride here. Uh -huh. Daniel chapter 4. I gotta say, the early morning service was a lot more fired up than you guys. Oh, it was a lot, it was a lot more louder, and, and, and it's kind of quiet in here. Oh. But maybe we just struggle with pride. Maybe that's oh. Oh. Just gonna be <laughs> you know, what's interesting is that uh, the, the, the people that are afraid to really get out of themselves um, at church, uh, whether it's shouting amen or sometimes just Daniel there in the front row you know, to sing it for the Lord. Um, you know, these are very humble people because they don't care what anyone else thinks. They're, they're, they're here for God. Yeah. Self-conscious people are very prideful because it's yeah. I will. They're, they're, they're focused on themselves, right? right. I'll just about to throw that in there. there you, know, so. um, you know, the Bible says here in Daniel 4 that Nebuchadnezzar and has this kind of interesting personality, right? Um, Nebuchadnezzar would see something. So let's let me take you back to Daniel chapter two. You remember the statue, and Daniel interprets it for him, and and then he's just in awe of God. And he always come back to this place of, wow, that's the Most High God. Yeah. But then some time would pass, and he'd start thinking about that dream a little too much. And you remember what happened? Oh yeah. He goes, well, the head of gold was me, but there were some other ones that were coming after me. So he goes, you know what? I don't know what I'll do. I'll build my own statue. And so he built a statue that was just all gold, <laughs> saying. Babylon's never going to end. And he got prideful and no longer had that same heart of God is the most high God. And of course, then the edict came that to bow down to the statue and he almost killed Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. We studied that out last week. Yeah. Um, this happens a lot of times in the Bible where people have what looks like repentance initially, but it's actually not biblical repentance. You guys remember Pharaoh? And the plagues of Egypt. And God sent through a servant Moses, let my people go from slavery. And he'd be like, no. And the Bible says he would harden his heart. And then what happened? God brought the plagues down. And when the plagues came down, he goes, okay, I'll let the people go. Moses, please pray for me. I repent. A little bit of relief. Things start going good. And then he goes, I'm not letting them go. We can be like this as Christians. We get broken initially because we feel guilt. And that's from the Holy Spirit, right? He convicts us when we sin. And we go, you know something? I'm going to cut off this relationship because anytime this person talks to me, I end up falling into immorality or impurity or whatever it might be. And you go, I'm going to be radical. I'm done. You get the phone. You delete the phone number. Maybe you change your phone number. You get radical about your repentance because you want to be pure. Right. Come on. A couple of weeks go by. But man, I think I'm pretty strong in this area. <laughs> and I really want to share my faith with her, you know. I don't want to totally cut her off from the kingdom. And the justification starts coming in, and then soon you go, you know something, let me just pull out the old phone bill online and try to find the number, and you get the phone number, and, 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 and you go, and the next thing you know, you're back on your face again. Verse Corinthians 10 says, um, if you think you're standing firm, watch out that you do not fall. And humility is the understanding that any of us can fall. I'll never forget when I counted the cost to get baptized as a 13-year-old. Uh, the, the leader who was leading my account in the cost study, he goes, Mike, do you ever think you could fall away? I go, never. Uh -huh. Now it's funny, in reflection, that sounds a lot like who in the Bible? Peter. Peter. <laughs> but he stopped me, he discipled me, he goes, Mike, anybody can fall away. Yeah. The right answer is, yes, I could fall away. Yeah. And that was humbling, because I, I, one of the things that, that I struggled with in studying the Bible, it took me a while to study the Bible as a young teen, was pride. And because I knew so much more about the scriptures than my other preteen friends in our preteen class, and it's kind of silly looking back now thinking about it, but 
I, I, I just had this pride about me where I wanted to look good. And one of the things he was counting the cost on for me to be baptized is that I have to understand I can fall. And every one of us, we can fall. Greater men than you and I have been led thousands in falling away. Yeah. Remember one evangelist told me that we need to walk in faith always kind of imagining there's a pit right next to us that any moment, if we're not careful, we could fall in. Wow. And I don't think this is fear motivated. I think that keeps you humble. It's reality. Because we live in a dark world, and so we need a daring faith. And a daring faith only comes by having true humility. So King Nebuchadnezzar now writes to us, and it's kind of cool. He writes in verse 1. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar, to the people's nations. This is actually from Nebuchadnezzar, a letter, right? Daniel's writing it, but it says, To the people's nations and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs. How mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. You go, man, he's not in a good place right here. You ever watch the movie where the beginning of the movie starts with the end? Yeah. And so you kind of see this end scene or something. And then the whole movie then all of a sudden goes back to the beginning. And you're trying to like figure out how we got here, right? Well, this is kind of the writing style that's employed here. It starts with Nebuchadnezzar in a good place fired up here, going, God's the most high God, his kingdom endures forever, and now we're going to go back, if you read verses 4 and on, to how he got to this place, okay? Now for time, I'm just going to explain it a little bit. Basically, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, another dream, that terrifies him again. So same thing, he tries to get all the magicians and enchanters to interpret this dream. Nebuchadnezzar's a lot kinder here now, so he doesn't try to kill him again, amen? <laughs> I think he changed a little bit, but not complete repentance. And he essentially has this dream, and he goes, what is this? Well, the interpreter of dreams, our hero comes, and, and he goes, all right, here's the dream. In this dream, Nebuchadnezzar says he saw this massive tree that had these branches that reached to the ends of the earth and touched the sky. It says that all of the leaves were beautiful, its fruit was abundant, that under all the beasts of the field found shelter. In this vision... It's revealed when Daniel interprets the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar, his empire, is this tree. But then, all of a sudden, Daniel sees something not so good for Nebuchadnezzar. A messenger, or a holy angel, comes down and hacks off the fruit, the branches, the tree, cuts the tree down, and then the remaining stump of this tree is put, locked down with iron. And the verse 17, it says the decision is announced by the messengers, the holy ones, declare the verdict. This is the verdict of the most high sovereign God. Remember, one of the themes of Daniel is to show that God rules the nations. God is sovereign over his kings, that he lifts up the lowliest of men, he brings down the haughtiest of men, right? And Daniel's always very kind. I love in verse 19 in the middle there, um, uh, it says... Uh, Daniel answered, remember his Babylonian name was Belteshazzar, answered, my Lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. So again, we see tact in how he's going to share this hard truth, but he speaks the truth in love. Can we imitate that, brothers and sisters? Well, he continues on, and look at what he says here about how to avoid this outcome. It actually could have been avoided. You see, God dictates things, but we all have free will and how we respond. Look at this. We're going to look in um, Daniel chapter 4, verse 27. It says, Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right, and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Well, if Nebuchadnezzar would have listened to the advice of Daniel, he would have never have to go through what he's about to go through. Let's see what happens here. Verse 28. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is it not this great Babylon I have built as a royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed to you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You'll be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. He thinks clearly. God wants all the glory. But we should not take glory for our achievements to ourselves. 
You know, um, I think we can struggle with this as Christians. Our, we, we, we've seen God do miraculous things in our church, have we not? Yeah. God's grown our church so fast. And, 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 and honestly, one of the things we can struggle with is we can go, man, look at what we've done at the Boston Disciples Church. Look at our glory. Look at, look at what. You can, you can stand up here baptizing someone and go, man, I am just a man. You know, I spent all these long hours studying the Bible with this guy late nights, you know, and, and this, is, this is awesome. You want a gold star for baptizing somebody. That type of mentality. And yet we need to remember who adds to his church. Acts 2.47 is one of my favorite scriptures. It says the Lord added to his church. God will always add to the church when the church is doing what it's supposed to be doing. We don't have to worry about that. We don't have to take credit for ourselves. We just simply are servants used by God. And I know how many of us want to be used by the Lord here. I mean, you want me used to do great things? You know, some of you didn't raise your hand, but amen. I, 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 I believe you do want to do great things. Maybe you're a little tired. That's okay. Uh, God, God wants to mold you. He wants to use you to do powerful things. But it's going to require humility. Amen? This is interesting. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 8. We kind of um, find this concept in Deuteronomy. Of course, Deuteronomy is giving them instruction for what they'll do and how they'll live when they inherit the promised land that God promised to give them. You know, I believe God's promised us an incredible promise if we're faithful to Him. A world that's evangelized in our generation. Amen, guys? Where every single person gets to hear about Jesus. We are a church that is trying to change the world. One soul at a time. And it's one disciple who makes another disciple who makes another disciple. And there's hardships that come in doing that. You'll study the Bible with a lot of people that won't make it. You been there? Yeah. You'll baptize friends. They'll fall away. Yeah. But God's looking for those whose faith is real. It's not about them. It's about God. And that's where the humility comes in. And God warned them. He said, you know, when you go to the promised land, you're going to be tempted to think that you did this on your own strength. You're going to build your houses. Things are going to be great. You're going to be tempted to give glory to yourself. Look at what he says. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 10. Come on, Mike. When you've eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, then all you have is multiplied. You know, when you baptize a ton of people, and you blow out your special missions goal, when things are going good in your ministry, look what he warns us of. Verse 14. Then your heart will become proud, and you'll forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He goes, you'll forget where you came from. You'll forget the slavery to your sin, the slavery you had to grieve, the slavery of that bitterness where you couldn't forgive that person. Don't forget the slavery of the world. He goes, I brought you out of that. Of course, Jesus died and his blood purchased us and he redeemed us from that. Look at verse 15. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known, to humble and to test you so that in the end it might go well with you. We learn that God will purposely test us sometimes. He never tempts us into sin. But he'll allow circumstances in our lives to test us so that we stay humble. Amen? He wants the glory. He wants the power. Verse 17. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers. as today. Amen? God wants the glory. Um... We can struggle like this in school, right? You go, man, I really cranked that exam because of how hard I studied. But who gave you the ability to study? Uh, who gave you your mind? Uh, Athletes can go, man, I really cranked that race in my track meet, and I got first place. I am the man, I'm so quick. You go, well, who gave you the ability to run? Uh, who formed you that way? So you have that athletic skill, right? And the ability to learn and to grow. And so I think the goal is, guys, it's not saying that we can't be, you know, feel good about accomplishments, but it's who do we give the glory to? Do we give it to ourselves or do we give it to God? Wow. And anytime people take the glory away from God, God gets upset. I'll, I'll never forget one time uh, uh, we were on YouTube. We we're just surfing some of the sermons uh, on our, uh, uh, our church's different websites, just kind of listening to sermons. 
And it was kind of funny because Chanel and I were laughing. There were a lot of sermons that were, that were taken from sermons I had done. And it was interesting because, uh, you know, some people, they're, they're humble. They go, you know, hey, man, I'm going to share this, this sermon that uh, I got from another preacher, blah, blah, blah. I always try to do that when I preach. You guys know, if I preach Kip's sermon or somebody else's, I'll just tell you, right? Because at the end of the day, I understand that there are people way more wiser than me, and if it can have an impact, I want to use it. Amen? Amen. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. But it was funny listening to one sermon that was literally word for word, even like story for story. Oh, wow. And, and it was interesting because no credit was given at all. Now, I personally did not care because I, I go, amen, if it impacts someone, that, that's my heart and my hope is that people will get saved from it. I, I genuinely don't struggle with it. But my wife was really defensive for me. You know, she was just like, you know, like they, did, he didn't even mention you or acknowledge you or no, all this kind of stuff, right? Um, and, and it's interesting because I imagine like that helps us understand how God feels. We, we like take the glory that God's the one that designed everything. He designed us and we get all excited about it. God's like, dude, you like totally copied that. You got that from me and you're like taking credit for it. And it's kind of foolish if you really think about it. God created the universe, the stars. I mean, God, no man has ever created anything that God's created. It's not possible. Our God is so glorious and so awesome, and so he deserves all the glory and all the praise. Now, I love to go back to Daniel chapter 4. If that preacher's listening, I love you. Go repent. I did stuff all like that all the time when I was a young preacher, so I didn't. I, I can't, I can't uh, look down on anybody. It's how you learn, you imitate. In Daniel chapter 4, it's interesting that verse 34... I love this verse here. It says, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. And that's our point to look to God, right? And my sanity was restored. Humility helps you be a sane person. Amen, brothers and sisters? Yeah. And you know, have you ever had your roommates a little insane or your spouse? Or you know, you're probably just struggling with some pride, right? But you know something? A lot of times you get insane, right? We, we can think of a lot of times sermons and we go, well, this is good for so-and-so. But we don't apply it to ourselves. These are signs of pride. Signs of pride are, 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 are you're thinking about the other person. I hope they're hearing this and really convicted about this. Yeah. Sign of pride is looking for a shout-out in the sermon. I hope they mention my name. You know, you look through the good news. You're waiting in GNN for your picture to pop up. These are signs of pride. Pride is, is, is wanting the glory. You want to be mentioned. You want the, the spotlight. And you got to look down deep in your heart and go, well, why? Well, why? You forgot to look up to heaven. And when you look to God, what happens? I know for me, there's, there's times, and I struggle, guys, with, 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 with pride. I do. Um, I'm tempted sometimes to get the glory. I get sad sometimes when I feel like our church should have been mentioned for something and it wasn't. Those, those feelings hit me, but I know they're very dangerous because of examples like this in the Bible. And I have to remember, I don't want God to oppose me, number one. But number two, when you look up to God, a lot of times when I'm feeling all this emotion, I just need to go on a good prayer walk. And, 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 I, and I pray to God, or, or for me, I usually like just I go in this room, you know, or get on, you get on your knees or whatever. And you pray, and what happens? You, you stand before a holy God, and you realize, dude, what am I thinking? I'm a nobody. I'm a sinner. Like, without God's grace, I'm a sinner. The only reason I can be called a saint is because of the grace of God. Every day, I know for me personally, every day is a fight to stay spiritual. From the moment I wake up, there is a pull from the spirit of Babylon in this world to pull me towards social media and not go to God. To pull me towards checking my email and not go to God. You need to know this, brothers and sisters. There is a spiritual war you are fighting. Yeah. To build your own kingdom, to get into pride. Every day when I walk the streets, my eyes wander sometimes and look at places they should not. And I hate it. I'm ashamed of it. And I know I need God's grace because lust is a daily battle and fight. I know for me, I want attention. I like when I get mentioned for doing something good. There's something broken inside of me that feels great about that. But I know I have to put that back to the Lord. I have to. That's when I start going insane. Right. And you know how it is? That's when you get obsessive about things. And you think, man, this person does not like me. They looked at me the wrong way. I was not selected to this because they think I'm a loser. And we start believing lies. Right. 
And they're like, oh, actually, I just forgot about it. Or whatever, you know, and I'm like, you ever been there? You just believe this total delusional thing, and then, you know, someone's like, oh, actually, I just lost my phone. That's why I couldn't respond. I'm sorry. Yeah. And you're like, you were like ready to like jump on a cliff or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Insanity! Now, I do want to make a disclaimer. Though. I'm not talking about people that actually have legitimate mental illnesses that have chemical imbalances. That's not what we're talking about today. But I believe a spiritual insanity can happen, and we can feel feelings of depression and sadness and things like this. and can hit us and just chaos in our minds because we're not looking to God. But when you look to God, everything makes sense again. You can forgive people that hurt you because you go, man, dude, what was I thinking? I'm like, I hurt God so much. Why would I not even extend the forgiveness he offers me. Looking to God saves your mind. And you got to understand, your mind needs to be renewed. That's why the scriptures say to renew the mind in Romans 12, 1, right? There's a book called God's Psychiatry that I, I, I read uh, part of it many years ago. I was trying to find it because there's a really cool story in there um, uh, that talks about how what this guy did is they took him, uh, you know, this is like back, I believe, in the 50s before we know, knew a lot of what we know about mental health today. Uh, but they went to a, a mental health institution where people who had challenges were, were staying or were depressed or, or sad or, or um, had these issues. And what he did is they went there and they just had everyone, if I can remember the story right, you can buy the book to find out the actual story. But um, they had everyone, I believe, read like Psalm 23 a certain amount of times every day. And then focus on just praising and worshiping God. And they did this for a series of weeks. Literally, most of them came out totally healed, insane. Wow. Wow. And, and the idea here was, this was not some like religious thing where preachers going in and hitting people and they're falling over and saying they're healed <laughs> for a day and then they're not really healed. Wow. You know how that is. That, that's not what I'm talking about. Like, their mind literally reprogrammed because what happened was they looked to God instead of themselves. And here's the thing I want to put before you. All pride and insanity is simply looking to self and not God. Because you're trying to be in control of your own life, which is crazy. Like control is an illusion. Is anyone in total control? No, no that's what the book of Daniel is about. God is sovereign. God is the one who, who, who leads. Why do you get angry when someone cuts you off on the road? Because you had your plan, your direction you're going, and someone interfered on that plan, right? And so the anger comes. If you were totally surrendered to God, you'd totally be at peace. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying you know, something might startle you or whatever, but I'm just saying you'd be at peace about it, right? Yeah. Pride comes before the fall. And the way to be healed is to look to God, and, and everything gets right when you look to the Lord. I mean, uh, I love it, just going to God and, and, and thinking about Jesus. We so much look to men, and we look to our circumstances instead of lifting our eyes up to heaven. You know, the second point, and the last point, we're going to look in Daniel chapter 5. Right. And, and we'll just kind of read this whole story here uh, together in Daniel chapter 5. The second point is the writings on the wall. You ever heard that expression? Yeah. Uh, that comes from this story in Daniel chapter 5 that we're going to read. And this is our second king who struggled with pride. In Daniel 5 verse 1, it says, King Belshazzar uh, gave a great, great banquet to for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. They actually think they discovered the place where this happened. They discovered a, a, a table in Babylon that could sit 5,000 people. Is that crazy? Oh. So they, they, they were really serious about partying, amen? <laughs> Verse 2, it says, While Bel Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Okay. Um, this is now about 20 years later from the last story we passed. And just this is going to be important to understand the context. Babylon's now in a very weakened state. The Medes and the Persians have actually started conquering, um, and, and they're kind of, in, in one sense, you know, being defeated um, uh, all from, from uh, without. They were just kind of pressured in. And, and at this point, the reason that this happened is Nebuchadnezzar was a man of great strength and character. And you guys have seen it if you study out like Roman emperors and stuff. You've got a leader who has great strength and great character, and then their son is a bumbling idiot who just likes to party and have fun, and they take over the empire, and what happens? And it flows. There's always a correlation between empires breaking down and moral decay. Isn't that fascinating? Like, God knows what he's doing when he tells us to have good morals as Christians. If our church is going to thrive, we've got to have good morals. Amen? And this is why it's important that we live righteously. 
But what's interesting here is that many scholars, they thought for a long time, they thought Daniel's fake because archaeology, and it's true, shows us that Belshazzar was not the last king of Babylon. But the Bible says he was. Now, anytime you have history saying something and the Bible saying something, which one do you believe? The Bible, the Bible if you're a person of faith. But literally, everyone thought, well, that's just must be wrong. This Daniel's all jacked up, doesn't know what he's talking about, that's why the Bible's fake and there's no God, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's kind of interesting because in the 1850s, they made a discovery. And this discovery showed that the king at the the last king, they were right, was a guy named Nabadanus. But Nabadanus had um, uh, a, a son, and his son was named Belshazzar. Now, interesting, they discovered that Nabadanus um, was, uh, in a sense, the grandson, and then by, in effect, uh, Belshazzar was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And so that's why he calls him, uh, Belshazzar is, uh, you know, calls Nebuchadnezzar his father. Uh, father was a term in the Bible that can be used for grandfather. And you understand that when you study out like the genealogies of things, and even in Aramaic, the word's the same. But what's interesting is we know historically that Nabadanus had gone and left Babylon and flee and went to make the stronghold of the empire in another city. And so what would happen is then they would have what they call co-regent kings. And so they made Belshazzar, his son, a de facto king, if you will, to rule things over. And God's word is always right. God's word knew that before even the world discovered that. Pretty cool. I thought that was cool. We'll read on and look at what happens. So, in verse 3, So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. A lot of those are similar to the statue, reminding us that what they were doing by bringing in the temple artifacts from God's sanctuary, and then drinking this wine and getting drunk, and then praising the gods of these gold, silver, it's by an effect, he was saying that the gods of man's kingdom is greater than Jehovah God. Verse 5. Suddenly the finger of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. Now, you might miss it if you don't see it, but notice what's no mentioned there. The lampstand. Where was the lampstand from? Solomon's temple. The lampstand was in the, 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 most holy, the holy place, excuse me, that lit up the light for the bread of presence, which of course foreshadowed Christ. And when the priest would go in to the holy place, that lamp was always to continually be lit. In fact, the church is now called the lampstand of God, his Holy Spirit that keeps the church on fire. Are you with me right here, guys? Oh but now this pagan is using it in this pagan revelry to light up his ungodly orgy, this party, and the light lights up the wall where the finger of a man writes out God's word. Is that pretty awesome? <laughs> well, look at this in verse 6. It says, The king watched the hand as it wrote. Verse 6, His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. The king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought and said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads the writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Well, notice he says the third highest ruler. Why is that from what I told you earlier? Right. Remember, number one is uh, the actual king, and then number two is Belshazzar, his son, the, the co-regent king, and then number three would be Daniel. So, again, the Bible knew that before even man discovered that. Pretty cool. Verse 8. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what is meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. Oh, king, live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight, intelligence, and wisdom like that of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, I say, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. Interestingly enough, guys, he's the chief. he was the chief of them. Notice, is he at this party? No, he's a man of conviction. Do not go to nightclubs or parties and things where ungodly things are happening. Can I get an amen, guys? Be like Daniel here. Verse 12. This man, Daniel, whom the king called Belshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, 
Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father, the king, brought from Judah? Now, keep in mind, Daniel's around 80 years old now. An old man. Remember, we met him in Daniel chapter 1 when he was 15. Verse 14. I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and the enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means. But they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck. And you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I'll read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. O king, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the peoples and the nations and the men and everyone he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was disposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from the people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. Remember, God poses the proud. Amen, guys? You had the goblets from his temple brought to you. And you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze and iron and wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote this inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mean, mean, tekel, parson. This is what these words mean. Mean, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And Persis, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed with purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Woo! The writing on the wall was, your days are numbered. Your time is done. And that night he died. The writing on the wall was God's judgment coming on an unrepented people. You know, for us, guys, what do we take from this story? Well, I think we can learn a lot of things. One, don't get drunk. Getting drunk leads you to doing all kinds of crazy things. But you know how it is when there's drunkenness. You kind of, people actually kind of share what they really feel and think. And they get open too much. And what's he doing in his drunken state? He gets the articles from God's holy sanctuary where God was worshipped. And makes a mockery blaspheming them by getting drunk. And worshiping what they're made of. Is that intense? This is what his pride led to. I think also, we learned that you've got to learn from the lessons of the past. And what you've seen. This is crazy. He, Daniel mentions to Belshazzar, before he gets into even the writing of the, 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 what the, the inscription means. He doesn't just give him the inscription. He gives him a little history lesson here. He tries to help him on out. He says, dude, your, your father, we know, grandfather. Um did this, was prideful, and look what happened to him. And he still did not learn even though he saw it happen. Guys, do you learn from the Bible and the people that have gone before you? Do you learn from disciples? You guys seen people fall away, have you not? Yeah. Do you learn from what they did? You go, man, I don't want to repeat that. Oh, come on, bro. we got to be great learners. That's what a disciple is. A disciple, that word means student. If you're a great disciple, you should be taking notes today. I believe a disciple has a Bible, has a notepad, maybe use your phone or, your, or something like that. You don't have to be insecure right now and everyone look around and stay tuned. <laughs> but, but, but I really want to call it, this for the members of the church. To, we've got to be great students, guys, that know our Bibles. Or are you someone that just comes to church and leaves and forgets what you heard? One thing I really appreciate in the North is what they've done is they go, you know, I love Daniel. He puts out a message to his group. He says, hey, what, what did you guys take away from the sermon this week? And it's awesome, see, because what he's doing is he's calling people to learn and to actually hold what they take from the sermon versus just walking away going, ah, I don't remember what that was about, you know? It's the scriptures that we've got to write on our hearts. 
I think the most intense thing, though, in my personal opinion, that this man did, and this is where pride can lead you to. It can lead you to a place where your heart's so hard you never can come back to God. Wow. Now, if you're here today, you go, oh, that might be me. No, that's not you. You wouldn't be in a church building listening to a sermon. Amen? Amen. This, this is a scary place. His time was up. There was no repentance. The writing was on the wall. And why? Well, it's the sin of blasphemy. What's it mean to blaspheme something? Blaspheme is to treat a holy thing with disdain or contempt or as a common thing. And this way he did. He treated the things that were made holy and dedicated to God by the priests in the Old Testament as common. And God goes, I'm done with you. Enough's enough. Sometimes theologians, we get to, they, they get to like into the, 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 the weeds and, and they go, well, in the Old Testament, you know, the Bible says God... Hardened Pharaoh's heart, but sometimes it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. And does that mean we have free will or not? And you just got to go, listen, dude, this guy killed babies after baby after baby. And God goes, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. God has his limits. Don't believe me. We'll see it in the scriptures here in a moment. But the writing was on the wall for this guy. And that ought to have us have a good, humble fear of God and a reverence for God. The holy. Revelation chapter 17, we find Babylon is spiritualized. Because, of course, Rome was the revived Babylon. And, of course, any empire that's against God, we may experience these things in our lifetime. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. You guys still with me here? Yeah. It says, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on the many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery. The inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. The angel carried me away in the spirit into the desert. There I saw a woman sitting on the scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemes, names, and seven heads and ten horns. And of course, there were ten Caesars that persecuted the church and uh, seven geographical areas. I'm not going to get into all that right now. But the point is, is that Rome was the beast in the, old, in the, in the book of Revelation. And the prostitute would be Imperial Rome, the great city that literally all the nations came to to drink. The Bible uses this analogy to get intoxicated by her materialism. Very similar to America. The Bible goes on and says in verse 4, The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, was glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand. Well, we're seeing some imagery from Daniel, are we not? Literally, the, we see drunkenness. And now again, a golden cup which would remind us of just the mockery that was made of God's holy things. Filled with the abominable things and the, fifth, the filth of her adulteries, the title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Prostitutes, and the Abominations of the Earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore the testimony to Jesus. Are you ready to die for your faith? Don't tell me you're ready to die for your faith and you cannot come to Bible talk. Don't tell me you're ready to die for your faith. And you cannot call back a brother and have a discipleship time. That, that, that's a lie. You are part of Babylon, brother and sister. And not part of God's church. You may be a member on our roster. But in God's eyes, the world is drunk on the destruction of Christianity. And you got to be ready to take a stand. And it may come a time where you have to stand for your faith and be willing to die for it. Like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Like Daniel. And you got to be ready. But the encouraging thing is in verse 14. They will make war against the Lamb, the world, right? The beast, all these ungodly people, these images that are used. But the Lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And with them will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. The church says, Brothers, yeah. you've been called, you've been chosen. Now you've got to be faithful. And that's what I'm talking about, having a faith in a dark time. No matter how dark it gets. We all have weaknesses. But what makes us strong is we bring them to God in His holy lights. And then God does a mighty work in us to stand. And the promise is that the Lamb will overcome. You know, Matthew 24, verse 36 through 42, for time, I'm not going to read it. But it says that Jesus will return at a time where you don't expect it. In fact, the Bible paints the picture that it'll be like the days of Noah. People will be partying and having a good time, just like Belshazzar and his 
Belshazzar, when his, uh, uh, all his royal people, all the thousand people invited, just having a good time, getting drunk. Man, that writing on the wall sobered him up real quick. More than 10 cups of coffee, amen? I mean, he, 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 was, he was paying attention now, and he was going to die that night. But the greatest sin was blasphemy. I think this is a sin that's crept into our church. Because COVID hit. And we're not done. I'm going to go to a few more scriptures here. But COVID hit. And for a lot of us, we got spiritually lazy. Spiritually overweight. And holy things became common things. Because I just go to church, click on a link, and boom, I'm at church. And we essentially brought in the spiritual holy things into the pagan world. What do I mean? Well, think about what he did. He brought in the vessels that were used for worship, including the lampstand, into this pagan party. Hasn't the world done that to Christianity? I mean, they've taken baptism, one of the sacred things in the sanctuary, where someone becomes a Christian, 1 Peter 3.21, when someone's saved by the blood of the Lamb, amen? Amen. And they've taken it and they've made it an outward sign, some symbol, some ceremony. We have baptismal services once a month and it does not necessarily mean you're saved. And, and all this garbage and false doctrine that's out there, right? Yeah. They've taken something holy and messed it up. Right. If I think about grace, the precious doctrine of God's grace. And the world has taken it and made it a cheap grace. Sin all you want, you can be forgiven. That's what the world does. But you know one I think that they've taken and, and made a mockery of in the world is communion. Taking the elements, the bread that is the broken body of Jesus and the juice that is his blood. But I think over COVID, when we stop passing the plate and stuff, I think we've gotten less reverence for what we are actually doing. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Paul writes to the church that was really jacked up and starting to look like Babylon. In fact, it was so bad they were getting drunk off the communion wine. Can you imagine that? Come to church, drink a little too much of the communion wine and, and, and getting intoxicated. And they were divided. There were cliques in the church. The richer members were ripping off, the, the, the not giving to the poorer members. Um, there was a lot of sexual morality in the church. And this is Paul, one of Paul's solutions. Verse 23 says, for what I received, chapter 11, verse 23, for what I received from the Lord, what I passed on to you, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats or drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Woo! That intense one? He says, listen, the reason that you're sick spiritually, and you know how it is when you're sick, congested, and you're contagious, right? Sick spiritual people infect other people. Yeah. Yeah. You know how it is when you're weak. You, you're trying to lift that weight and you just can't. You don't have the strength to. You know how it is when you're spiritually falling asleep. That means you fell away. That was a euphemism for death a lot of times in the Bible. You fell away spiritually. He goes, the reason why is you're not taking communion in the right way. You've disregarded something that's holy and you've made it common because you haven't taken the time to examine yourself. The Bible says that when we take communion, we are supposed to examine ourselves to see if there's any sin in our lives. And we're supposed to remember why we became Christians. That's why we have people come up here and share who they were before in the darkness and what happened to help them come into the light. I appreciate Anna sharing for communion this morning. Amen. That's awesome. But, but, but we get faith, and then we wonder why we're hurting spiritually. You're not remembering the death of Jesus, that he died for you. He shed his blood for you. And we treat communion as a common thing. So how do I know that? Well, there could be people that miss church, and they have no problem even asking a brother to come and bring them communion. 
No problem at all. Just got really quiet. You know, you're commanded not to miss this. Yeah. I want to talk to the disciples who are committed to coming to church. Amen. We got a conviction. Every member who is not with us on Sunday morning needs to have communion brought to them. Yeah. And, and you got to go and love them. And you got to teach them. This is important to their spiritual health. Right. They're struggling. We have lost a lot. And this is second one I want to talk about with communion. The other things that are holy that have been taken out of the sanctuary is, is people. We are all made holy. Are you with me right here? We're a royal priesthood. When you understand that people are holy, you're willing to drive any distance to go and see them and love them and bring them communion. And yet some people can't call someone back. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Like that is a wrong sin. Uh, to, to, to not respond to a brother or a sister who is spiritually trying to strengthen and help you. We, we, we've treated holy things with contempt. It's blasphemy, your brothers and sisters. Now, praise God we're in the New Covenant. Because you go read about blasphemy in the Old Testament, you'd be dead. Yeah. You weren't to blaspheme your parents. They said, you, literally, they kill you in the Old Testament. Um, you can go to BibleGateway.com. Good resource. Um, you can type in any word and it'll bring up all the list of all the scriptures on blasphemy. It'll convict you. You can type in another word called contempt. Contempt is similar to blasphemy. It's a disdain for holy things. Um, I'm spending some time on this because I want to close in Hebrews 10 here. In Hebrews chapter 10. If you're visiting, um, you probably figured out by now we are a church that just preaches the Bible and doesn't hold anything back, amen? Um, and I, I hope you come back, but the reality is, is that there's some tough things in the Bible. And we're a church that holds everyone to the standard of the scriptures. Everyone who got baptized decided I'm going to love the Lord with all my heart. And secondly, I'm going to love the community. I'm going to put Jesus and his kingdom first in my life. And as we transition out of this COVID play phase, we're going to be doing a, a, a purge, if you will, of our membership. We're really going to recount the cost with every single person to get a definitive membership. Because I think what's happened is you've had some people that are just not living up to the commitment that they made when they said, Jesus is Lord. And, and that's not some scare tactic or anything like that. If you're a disciple, you're going to be fine. We all have sin. It's not an issue of having sin. I have sin. I confess sin every week, every day. I have sin. Are you with me right here? It's an issue of commitment and covenant. Would you ever want to be in a marriage where uh, your spouse, just unfaithful with someone, you know, once a month, not a big deal? Certainly not. Nope. Right? Thank you. That wouldn't make any sense. And yet, again, we're content being unfaithful to God once a month. Wow. Wow. So we were not living up to what we counted the cost on and said that we would when we got baptized. So the question comes, if you were to count the cost with yourself, what I mean is study the Bible with yourself. Could you baptize yourself with where you're at right now? Because you know, if you come a baptized disciple, you got to be a disciple. Are you with me right here? Yeah. And could you baptize yourself right now? If not, that's okay. You go, amen. Thank God for the blood of Christ. Today I'm going to make a decision to change and repent. Look in Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 25, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejects the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the spirit of grace. Is that intense? This is, this is the new covenant. We're not talking anymore. You, you might go, well, Daniel, that's Old Testament, so maybe I blah, 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 right? This is New Testament. And he says here, some people have gotten in the habit of missing meetings of the body. Now, another way this can be translated is that they've forsaken the worship assembly. So it's not an issue of like, oh, I just missed this week. It's an issue of habitually missing meetings of the body, but it's with purposeful intent. You forsake it. Right. Why? Right. Well, there's usually excuses and reasons we give. Well, I have to work on Sunday morning. I have to work on Wednesday night. 
Well, brother, what comes first, God or work? God. God. And we all, we all studied that out when we studied the Bible, amen? Right. Because we wanted to obey the scripture. But it's interesting because he goes on in verse 26. It says if we deliberately keep on sin, we deliberately keep on missing the meals. He goes, at some point, no sacrifice for sins is left because it's, you're treating the body of Christ as an unholy thing. Because what's the body of Christ today? The church. The church. And you can read the whole thing from verse 19 on. It's the most holy place where we worship our God. It's not this physical building we're in. It's the assembling together. And it requires a ton of humility and submission. Are you with me right here, guys? So with these three things, I really want to call us to repentance. Number one, to have a holy reverence for the Lord's communion. And we're going to be talking more about that at leaders' meeting today at 2.30, okay? Number two, to have a deeper reverence for our brothers and sisters. It's not just our leaders we need to submit to and, and hold in high regard. It's every single Christian. Amen. Because God purchased every single Christian. And so that means we call each other back. We respond in the group messages. We love each other enough because we want to be invested. And if we have issues, we just talk about it. Amen? And we don't let the sun go down until we're resolved. Amen? Amen. Number three, I really want to call us again to make sure that we have a deep conviction that the writing's on the wall. God can come back at any moment. He will come to you whether he returns or you die first. One or the other has got to come first. Amen? But you've got to be ready because judgment is coming on this ungodly world. And only those who have the blood of the Lamb will be saved. You know, I find it interesting that in Daniel 4 and 5, in Daniel chapter 5, you had the responses of many different people, right? Of course, you had Belshazzar. Well, Be I keep on saying Daniel's name is Belshazzar, and then the king is Belshazzar, right? So there's a little, little difference with the team. You had the king, Belshazzar, the magicians and the astrologers. No change at all. And in fact, offers wealth, you know, still consumed with his materialism. That was his response to the writing of the wall. You could be like him today and go, you know what? Hey, man, this, this was nice, but I'm going to go and seek out an answer from someone else in the world. Number two, you have the magicians. And they couldn't figure it out why, because they couldn't read it or understand it. And you know, pride blinds you. You cannot read the Bible. You can read the Bible all day long, but it actually doesn't go into your heart. As Jesus said, there, uh, there will be ever you know, uh, hearing, but never perceiving. Are you with me right here? Third, you can be like the queen mother. She, she's a little bit on the better path. She goes, well, I know the right guy to go to. Amen. But you want to be like Daniel, amen? And Daniel, he could read and he could understand it, and he knew what to do because he was a humble man. Daniel was not participating in the feast because he was righteous. Daniel was still kind, but spoke the truth. And I believe it was this spirit of excellence and humility that he had before God, understanding that God is the ruler of all the kings. He's the king of kings that allowed him to see the Bible clearly. I want to encourage you, if you're visiting with us today, Study the writing on the wall. Study the Word of God. Study the Bible with the person that brought you. And be like our two sis new sisters and the brother that's getting baptized today. Be like them and respond immediately. Because pride comes before the fall. But if you're humble, the Lord will lift you up. And to God be the glory. Amen.